Hi everyone and welcome back to Learn Your Radiology. I'm Brent Weinberg. I'm happy to introduce this video to you today. One of my friends and colleagues, Cynthia Wu, is going to be telling us about vascular imaging of the head and neck. We're going to learn about when you would do vascular imaging of the head and neck, some of the key techniques that we use, and then we'll learn a little bit more about some of the common pathologies that you see. So without further ado, I want to give you this introduction and turn it over to Cynthia. All right, I think with that, maybe we should get started and get rolling. Um, so uh, everybody, welcome. Uh, my name is Cynthia Wu. I'm one of the neuroradiologists here. And uh, my co-host uh, or co-teacher uh, for this session is Dr. Weinberg, who's down there, um, also one of our neuroradiologists. And um, today we're going to be talking a little bit uh, about vascular imaging. So this alphabet soup of CTA, CTV, DSA, MRA, MRV, vascular ultrasound, VUS, what, what are we looking at and what are we doing, right? So hopefully by the end of the session, you'll have a better uh, idea. I'm pausing on this slide because um, if you haven't heard already, you know, we're doing attendance by Canvas, so please go in and answer that with the quiz code, the Zygomatic, it's also in the chat. All right, so let's get started. I got no conflicts of interest to uh, declare. So what are we going to do here today? We're going to discuss some basic concepts behind vascular imaging. We're going to be talking about the differences between these alphabet soup items, CTA, CTV, DSA, MRA, MRV, both time of flight, uh, and contrast enhanced, as well as vascular ultrasound. And you hear that and you may be feeling a little confused. You're like, what am I doing? Please save me from all these alphabet soups. But uh, we're going to try to clarify that by first giving you an overview um, on what they are and when to order each of these exams, what's most appropriate. Um, we're going to then uh, run over the normal vascular anatomy um, of both the neck and the head. And then we're going to go over some basic pathology um, that you might come across um, looking using vascular imaging. So hopefully you'll go from save me to a win by the end of the session. And finally, we'll also give you the chance to be the radiologist and then play around with a couple of cases um, that uh, we have uploaded so that you'll get the chance to really make, uh, make some findings and make some diagnoses yourself um, and hopefully um, get, gain a better understanding of all these imaging modalities as we go through that. So first, let's go back to basics. How do you even see a vessel, right? Normally, a vessel just looks like a soft tissue. So what I'm looking at is an axial image of the brain over here. And uh, what you're seeing is that, you know, there's brain parenchyma, and there may be some soft tissues over here. Uh, there may be some vessels over here, but it's really hard to tell that apart from the regular brain parenchyma. So how can we make it stand out? Well, one easy thing, if you think of this as an empty cup, um, in order for you to see the cup better, uh, you what you can do is you can go ahead and add some ink, right? So in order for you to see this cup in the straw uh, and the water better, you just go ahead and add ink. So that's exactly what we do. We add contrast material. And so here you can see uh, very similar to the prior image, except we've added intravascular contrast. So suddenly all these arterial vessels are standing out against the background of the brain. So which modalities um, are using contrast? So CTA and CTV, so that stands for arteriogram and venogram, uh, DSA, which is digital subtraction angiography, and contrast enhanced MRA and MRVs all rely on this idea of putting in intravascular contrast material to make it stand out against the background. So what's the difference between an arteriogram and venogram? Well, it's all in the timing, right? So when you're thinking about giving a contrast bolus, um, by timing it correctly so that you image it when it gets into the arterial vessels, that's about 15 to 20 seconds after contrast injection, um, you can uh, then see the artery stand out, right? And similarly, if you go ahead and wait a little longer, so about 35 seconds, that's when the the contrast goes from the arteries to the veins, right? As they cycle through your body. And that uh, means that that's when you get us, if you want to do a CTV, you scan the patients 35 seconds after you inject the contrast. 
there is a technique known as bolus tracking. So this is very useful. Um, so what they do is they'll try to place a region of interest over an arterial vessel, usually the aorta, and then they'll scan that area repeatedly until you get, uh, until the machine sees that the contrast has gotten to that vessel. And at that point, the machine can then go scan the area of interest. So what does that look like? Well, we got this little video over here. So this is a thanks to YouTube. Um, somebody uploaded this ser series of uh, uh, bullish tracking. So you can see here's the aorta. They're tracking it. Now it's getting brighter and brighter. So now it's bright enough uh, for the aortic, uh, so you can know that the contrast has been pacified. The so now they're taking the time to scan. And hopefully, it takes a while to scan. You'll see now that the aorta has very nice arterial vascular contrast, and so do all the major vessels in the abdomen. Oh, that's okay. So that's uh, contrast tracking. Brett, did that play, by the way? Did, did you all see, see the video okay? It did play, and it had a lot of sound, too. It was kind of interesting. All right. Well, I am, I'm sorry about the, uh, it did the play. sounds, but okay. All right. So what whoops um so cta versus mra right so when do you choose ct versus mr well there's benefits and drawbacks to each of these things right so for um mm -hmm. ct it generally cts are faster than mrs right ct exam takes a couple of seconds to scan a patient mrs you can be on the order of half an hour to an hour even so that means if you have a patient who's trying to move all around then a cta will be better because they're uh, less sensitive to motion you can get those in that information quickly um, MRI, of course, will be more prone to motion. CTs require radiation, whereas MR does not require any radiation. Um, with these CTAs, you generally don't have to worry about metal. Certainly metal can cause artifact on CT, mm. but um, on MRIs, you, you always have to consider uh, basically the safety uh, issues with metal, right? So you need to clear the patient for, um, for metallic implants or maybe prior, uh, prior ballistic injury. Um, you use different kinds of contrast for CTA versus MRA. So for CTA, you generally have to give iodinated contrast. So patients may have issues with allergies. Uh, if patients have impaired renal function, you want to be really careful because you don't want to knock them over into renal failure with iodinated contrast. Whereas MRAs can be performed without contrast. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Or you can give gadolinium-based contrast, um, which has less issues uh, with renal toxicity and allergies. Uh, generally, CTAs, CTs are wider bore, so patients can tolerate that better, especially claustrophobic patients. And, um, uh, and then, but then there is an issue with contrast timing. So you just saw that example of a bolus tracking. And so when you have um, a CTA, you have to be very careful and follow the bolus because once that bolus goes into the venous phase, you're going to get a lot of what we call venous contamination. So both the arteries and the veins light up, and that makes it harder for you to see an issue with the uh, arterial um, abnormality or injury. Um, with MRAs, there's usually less of an issue with uh, venous contamination um, because you can use different techniques to suppress a uh, venous signal. So with CTAs, you usually have only one chance. So again, just as that idea of bolus tracking, we really need to follow that bolus, have it highlight the vessels and scan it. Whereas MRAs can generally be repeated. Um, with contrast enhanced MRAs, you kind of also have the same issue with just trying to catch that bolus at the right time. But when you're trying to do time of flight MRA, for example, you can usually repeat the acquisition um, to get the image you want if the first one fails for some reason. So what kind of images do you generate? Usually with CTA or MRA, we generally try to format them. So we do one acquisition and we format them in these thin 2D images, usually in the axial plane. So that, that's kind of what I'm trying to show here. You have an axial image of the brain um, and clearly you've got an abnormality over here. Um, but these thin images can then be reconstructed uh, in various ways. So you can generate thick images in each plane. Um, you can do these multi-planar reconstructions. So you can take those axial images, you're, you've acquired them already, 
and then generate a coronal image. You can generate a sagittal image. Now, these are not repeat scans. This is one scan, but then you're just taking that information because they're such thin slices, you can then reconstruct them in different planes. You can also do what's known as MIPS or maximum intensity projections. So here, what you do is you take a slab of a few images altogether, and then you find the pixel in each so you pick a pixel and in that pixel across that slab, if uh, the one image that has the highest uh, value in that pixel will be displayed. So what happens there is then you end up getting an image that looks a little bit better uh, at showing you the, excuse me, at showing you the extent of the vessel like you can see here. And then finally, you can do also volumetric reconstructions from, again, from that one acquisition, you can then do these fancy 3D acquisitions. And here you can see that this is a large aneurysm arising from the MCA. So the thing to know here is that the reconstructions that's offered may differ from, may differ from institution to institution. And also if you require it, if you request a disc from medical records from another hospital, they may not give you the thin source images or they may not give you all the reconstructions. So just know that all these are not necessarily made the same. Um, you know, the most important thing to have really are the thin images uh, because then if we have access to those, your friendly neighborhood neuroradiologist can help you do these recalls if you can get those thin images. But if all you're getting are, you know, two millimeter, five millimeter slices um, of a CTA, then you're not going to be able to actually do the reconstruction to generate these fancy um, 3D images or multiplanar recons. So let's switch gears. So we talked a good amount about CTA. So what is DSA? DSA is digital subtraction angiography, otherwise known as catheter angiography or traditional angiography. So this is the old school way where you go ahead and you actually access an artery um, with a needle and a catheter. And then you uh, then go ahead and thread that catheter up to the place you want it to be and then inject contrast through the catheter to highlight those those vessels so what what's happening here is that generally we try to go in through the groin um, through the, the iliac artery and then you can thread this catheter all the way up uh, if you're trying to do head uh, brain angiography for example you would thread it all the way through the aorta up through the common carotid and then try to target the internal carotid artery. And once you've got the catheter parked all the way up there, you can then do an injection. So this is what's happening here. You do an injection and suddenly you can see the vessels opacifying in the head. So um, just to show that again, this is a vessel uh, parked in the internal carotid. And as you inject, you can see the MCA, ACA showing up here. And then this is kind of the schematic showing that contrast being injected into the head. Okay, so what about vascular ultrasound and time of flight MRA? Why am I grouping these two things? Well, it's because they both rely on flow, the idea that blood is flowing and moving, and that's how you're seeing them. So vascular ultrasound and time of flight MRA don't require any intravascular contrast, right? So unlike the CTA we talked about before, unlike the DSA we talked about before, these two techniques work because our blood is flowing. So vascular ultrasound relies on something known as the Doppler effect. Um, you might remember this from physics. So this is going to be loud again. I apologize ahead of time. But when a car is driving towards you, you can hear the Doppler effect, right? So... <laughs> So you notice how the honking horn sounded. If you weren't awake before, I hope this is bringing you out of your postprandial nap, by the way. Um, but when the car is coming towards you, the, the horn sounds louder, or excuse me, the horn sounds higher pitched than it is when the car has passed you, right? And that's because when the car is coming towards you, um, the frequency of the sound is actually made higher by the fact that it's coming towards you. The source of the sound is coming towards you. Therefore, um, the frequency is actually getting higher. But then when the source of the sound is driving away from you, that stretches out that frequency, if you will. So it's going to sound lower than it did. Um, so vascular ultrasound uses that, um, takes advantage of that phenomenon. So what it does is you're going to have a transducer over here. 
okay? And it sends out an ultrasound wave towards your vessel, right? And if there's no flow in the vessel at all, the wave that bounces off of the vessel, it's going to be the same frequency as it was before. So there's no uh, recognition of any flow. If you send the wave out, but the flow, the blood is going towards you, then just like the car is going towards you, the, the uh, ultrasound waves that bounce back are going to be of a higher frequency than what you sent out. And that is registered as a, um, a as blood flow towards the, uh, the actual transducer. And then in the third option, oops, oh, I did not want to do that again. Okay, the third option here, you have um, the transducer sending out this ultrasound wave, but the blood is moving away from you, okay? And because of that, just like when the car has gone past you, that stretches out the ultrasound wave that's coming back towards the transducer. So then the ultrasound machine will register that as flow away from the transducer. What does that look like? That, that's the image it will produce. So when you put on Doppler, when you're scanning a patient, you're going to see that um, arterial flow will show up as red because you know it's flowing towards one direction and then venous flow because it's flowing the other direction is going to look blue. Okay, um, how about time of flight MRA? Um, so what happens with time of flight MRA is that the, um, the MRI will actually apply multiple um, radio frequency pulses to the area that you're trying to image and that suppresses the signal. Um, but because the blood is flowing in to that area, um, it hasn't received those radio frequency pulses. And so it has not been suppressed and therefore it still shows up as bright signal against the background of the suppressed tissue. So that's how time of flight or non-contrast MRA works. So what about, when do you use contrast enhanced MRA or what's the difference between time of flight MRA and contrast enhanced MRA? Usually when we're trying to do a brain MRA, so we're interested in intracranial vessels, we use the non-contrast time of flight or TOF technique. Um, that's because generally people, you know, if you instruct them not to move the, their head, they won't move their head. So it's not in an area with a lot of motion. And also, you know, it's generally the preferred method because you don't have to give any co contrast at all. However, MRA of the neck is usually performed with contrast because if you think about your neck, there are a lot of things actually moving if you're not, even if you're not trying to move, right? You have respiratory or breathing motion. You have um, pulsation from all these big vessels, right? And because of that, the, um, that anytime you have motion, um, a time of flight or non-contrast technique will be generally degraded um, by, by that motion. Because remember what we said before, you're relying on surprise, you're relying on suppressing the signal in an area of tissue and relying on the flow of new um, material into that area to get the time of flight MRA. So if you have a lot of respiratory motion, you can really mess with that, right? So um, generally when you, when you come to MRA, you'll see that our brain MRAs are performed with time of flight techniques, but MRA of the neck are, are performed with contrast. However, um, you do need contrast, right? So because of that reason, um, you know, some people may not want to do that and may not want to give contrast for one reason or another. So uh, a emergent MRA, such as for stroke, can also be performed with a time of flight technique. And that's actually done at Grady um, as a standard. So, um, Having said that, so we, again, generally for the brain, we do time of flight. For the neck, we do with contrast, but there's also a post-contrast MRA of the brain. And we usually reserve that for specific purposes, such as if we're worried about arterial venous shunting in an AVM or an AV fistula, or if we have a patient who's had an aneurysm that's already treated, sometimes doing a contrast enhanced MRA is a little bit more sensitive to identify any residual filling that you may get at the base of an aneurysm. Okay, so when do I order each test? And this perhaps is one of the highest yield parts of this, right? So if a patient, elderly patient comes in with a facial droop, so you may have noticed that he has a facial droop on the right, uh, the forehead is spared, right? But then down here, everything's drooping. You're worried, of course, about an acute stroke. So this patient is within window, time window for TPA or thrombectomy, what you want to do is you always want to start with a non-contrast head CT, right? Because you need to differentiate between hemorrhagic and ischemic stroke. 
And once you do that, if you don't have hemorrhage, then uh, you are thinking, okay, this could be an ischemic stroke. So you should consider a given PPA at that point, right? So the big takeaway here is that the CTA should not hold up you giving a patient TPA, right? If, if there is no hemorrhage and, you know, everything else, he falls within the window, everything else checks out, that's when you want to consider giving TPA. And then also maybe get a CTA of the head and neck. Notice here it's head and neck because you're worried about either a thrombotic or an embolic source um, for his um, stroke or potentially a dissection that could be in the neck. So you need to image both the neck and the brain to find out where that clot or where that, that dissection is, right? So again, ischemic stroke within the window, um, you know, you want answers fast. Um, you want to know if this patient has a large vessel occlusion that you can take to thrombectomy, do a CTA of the head and neck. And yeah, and that's essentially this point that if you have a large vessel cut off, generally we think of, um, you know, proximal vessel occlusion, either in the carotid or either uh, M1 branches usually, or of course, basilar cutoffs, um, you would want to consult neurointerventional radiology for a potential thrombectomy. So what about we change up the scenario a little bit, right? Uh, you're worried about stroke within window, you do a non-contrast head CT, and suddenly you see a hemorrhage, okay? So now the situation has changed completely. If you have hemorrhage, then you want to do CTA of the head only, okay? You don't need to do the neck because you're not worried about a thrombus in the neck. You're not worried about the dissection in the neck. You are trying to find the source for that hemorrhage, okay? If you have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, what you want to be looking for is an aneurysm, and that can be served by a CTA of the head. If you have a parenchymal hemorrhage, you're trying to look for either a hemorrhagic mass or maybe a vascular malformation, and that could be served by a CTA of the head, right? So if you have hemorrhage on that initial head CT, non-contrast head CT, your algorithm changes. Do a CTA head instead. And the reason why, you know, we want to avoid doing both neck and head is because your contrast bolus, you need to usually target that contrast bolus to image either the head or the neck. When we do both, you're really trying to do this like uneasy bargain. Um, you're going to get some venous contamination or you're not going to see your neck vessels really well. There, there's, there's basically trade-offs here, right? So if you don't need to make that trade-off, if you only need to identify what the source of hemorrhage is, you should use a CTA head. Okay, so let's change it up a little bit. Worried about a new stroke, but now patient is outside the window of TPA or thrombectomy, okay? You still want to start with a non-contrast head CT because you still want to know if they're bleeding or this could, if this could be an ischemic stroke. But if you have no bleed at that point, you might want to consider MRI and MRA instead of CTA. Why? Because an MRA is just much more sensitive for a parenchymal infarct, right? That's our gold standard for calling acute infarction. So that I would, that's why I would want to push for the MRI. And at the same MRA, you can delineate the vascular anatomy by MRA. And you're also looking potentially, you know, what if this wasn't a stroke at all? The MRI would be better at picking up other causes of focal neurological symptoms. Again, you would only do this if they're outside the window for TPA or thrombectomy. Um, you know, you're not really, the, the time sensitivity is much less, right? Okay, so when, uh, when might you want to, or what might you want to order something for a suspected traumatic arterial dissection or penetrating injury, such as this lovely gentleman with a knife sticking out of his neck. Um, this is not my image. This is somewhere in Cape Town. Um, literally, that's the name of, that's the title of this image or of this page describing this case, right? So if you see something like a penetrating injury, trauma, um, you want to do a neck CTA. Basically, you want to be able to exclude vascular injury in a case like this. Um, and of course, he didn't have one because he wouldn't be smiling otherwise, I'm pretty sure. Okay, what about someone who comes in with the worst headache of life, right? Worst headache of life. Well, you want to, again, start with a non-contrast CT. You guys sense this theme here? The, for an emergent indication, a non-contrast CT is really great. What you want to exclude here is something like this. Um, you, this is an axial image of the brain. You see the normal brain parenchyma, but then you see all this high density all filling the supracellular cistern. And you're, you might be saying, well, you know, you are showing us all these images with beautiful contrast enhanced things. But remember, this is a non-contrast CT, right? So on non-contrast CT, if it's bright like this, you have to worry about acute hemorrhage. And this is a case of a 
uh, acute subarachnoid hemorrhage. And when you have that, remember what you want to do next. You want to get a CTA of the head, just like that gentleman where you suspected stroke. This is a case where it's just another presentation of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. You want it because it's fast. And you again, you don't need the neck and you want to be able to find the source of bleed. And um, and in this case, actually, you might be able to sense something here. This was actually an aneurysm that has ruptured, causing um, this subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay. Um, so what about if you have a worst headache of life and you started with non con head CT and you see a slightly different scenario? This is a very, very, very subtle finding. But over here, you see that there may be a little bit of higher density than I might expect in the um, in the vein of Galen and the internal cerebral veins and over here in the straight sinus. So your radiologist calls you and you say, oh, I'm a little worried about a venous thrombosis, okay, a dural venous thrombosis. So then you want to do, instead of a CTA, you want to do a CTV, right? You want to do a venogram or an MRI and, or MRV of the head, both of which will allow you to see the veins. And here is an MRV of the head for that same patient. The things that you might easily meet, miss are the things that's not there. So what's not here is if you know the anatomy, there should be a straight sinus sticking straight out here, vein of Galen, internal cerebral veins, none of which are visualized in this patient. So there's some pretty significant durovenous sinus thrombosis on this case. Okay. What about a patient who's asymptomatic coming to an outpatient office uh, with some cardiac uh, cardiovascular risk factors or a carotid brui? Well, in this case, this is when that Doppler ultrasound comes in handy, right? Um, it's a good screening exam. It's non-invasive. You don't have to give contrast. It's not very expensive. So it's got all these benefits over a CTA or an MRA. So in this case, what I'm showing is that they're trying to scan the internal um, carotid artery and there you're seeing a plaque that's narrowing the lumen of the carotid artery. And they're measuring the velocity with which the blood is flowing through that internal carotid artery to figure out what the, um, how narrow basically the vessel is. Okay, so now we are going to go over some normal anatomy um, on a CTA. So um, if you wanna, so Dr. Weinberg is gonna lead this part, but if you wanna follow along, this is the link to that, um, to that thing. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So I just want to thank Dr. Wu for that great introduction of vascular imaging. Now we're going to move on to some more interactive cases. If you want to check out those cases, uh, you can follow the link at the bottom here. I encourage you to move on to the next video to see that overview. I want to thank everyone for tuning in today. Please check out the rest of the videos on our page and be sure to like and subscribe to these videos. Thank you.